the Bible is the key to all knowledge, release from bad energy that's building up in a community. Cannibalism still exists in a sublimated way, right? Shared story of who they are, where they came from, where they're going, why do we have the values we do? It was a trust system. And people think that that just pops up in a vacuum. How stupid could you possibly be? Our culture is, is built on this dead matter ideology. You are a sheep in your desires. The human grasping for God through history. We're not the people of the book. We're the people of imitating Jesus. Um, Illegitimate Scholar Podcast, episode 67 or so. David Gornoski. I do a radio show slash podcast called A Neighbor's Choice. It started off as a podcast and it became a, a live uh, FM, AM, um, all-in radio show for several years. And then I returned it back to the online format because I moved from the areas that I was uh, hosting shows, which was Orlando and Tampa Bay metro area on uh, two of the big uh, news talk stations in that in those markets. And uh, so I went back to online only format uh, over the last year. And we've focused on anthropology. We fo focus on mimetic theory, Rene Girard. We talk about new physics with my co-host, Dr. Yu, because I consider anthropology the key the, to understanding the problem that we're in. And then I look at technology and physics as a blueprint for the solution to what the problem is. The problem is the political situation we're in, the cultural situation we're in. And then the physics provides a kind of new perspective on how to get out of that. Um, and then at the same time, we, we integrate things in the world of biology and nutrition. We have uh, several basically sub-series of my shows. Things Hidden is our anthropology show that is in reference to Rene Girard's book, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, which is in reference to Jesus's words when he says, I have come to reveal things hidden since the foundation of, of the world. And then um, we also have a series called Seed Oil Survival, which looks at kind of the nutritional framework. We were one of the first programs in news media to pioneer the seed oil topic, and it's become much bigger than us, but we're happy that's happened so quickly. About, about on time with what I expected in terms of its reaching the mainstream, and it's still not quite there yet, but it'll continue to grow as people find success in getting these toxic chemicals out of our bodies. Uh, and then also we've got a, a show called Science and You. That's our physics show where we're doing some work in, in new physics. And then we have another show called um, the, the Science, which is our, our kind of pandemic show, which we don't do as much of right now because I guess they're, I guess they're busy in the lab cooking something up and we'll be ready when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, honestly, longtime listeners of of my show are going to know how perfect your introduction is for this show. It's like you were made to to come on, so I'm I'm glad that you're here. Um, but yeah, uh, anthropology, obviously, what what we cover here a lot. Um, I know a lot less about the science. I'm I'm famously, you know, uh, relatively at least, n not as good at it. But uh, we're going to talk about that today. You, um, so I, I'd love to talk a little bit about R Rene Gerard, probably R Rene Gerard a little bit later, probably, but I want to start with your article, right? The article about Ray Pete. America needs a Ray Pete summer. We just published that at Raw Egg Nationalist publication called Man's World Magazine. So, uh, yeah, it's a great, great piece. And I wanted to kind of give people an introduction to what I think is the future of politics. I call politics is downstream from thyroid. And so we've got to get our thyroids functioning well again, if we're going to have any approach at, at dealing with the madness of crowds, which is what politics is. Politics is the art of managing the madness of crowds. That's why it takes an insane psychopath to be good at politics. That's what politicians right. are for. Most of them are just not very competent at doing anything other than, you know, feigning, some kind of persona to 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 try to uh, manage the madness of the crowds that they believe they can stoke into popular consent, right? And that's the, yeah, that's the whole premise of politics. That's what that's what the gospel talks about politics as. And there's two two references in there. The the downstream of of culture, I think, is the normal quote. But I like what you're doing with it there. And then also the um, the madness of crowds, which is uh, uh, Douglas Murray, right? Uh, well, is that Douglas who? 
What? Oh, is that not Douglas Murray, the Madness of Crowds? I think he wrote a book called that, but I, I think he's getting that from an idiom probably much older than him. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure he is getting that from somewhere. Yeah, I'm not. A, but, I, yeah. I don't know too much about Douglas Murray in particular, but I think about Soren Kierkegaard's quote, which is the the crowd is a lie, right? And that kind of lets you know where I'm coming from, right? Is that you know, uh, you know, there's a certain kind of possession that takes place. I think on a physics level on a biological yeah. level, on a lot of different levels that we fully haven't fully put our minds to understanding what takes place in a local crowd, like in a rally or a protest, but also in a, in a kind of digital crowd when people get on social media and they get on mobs trying to cancel mm -hmm. someone or mock somebody because they made a stupid thing or something that was caught on tape, whether it's left, left or right, there's a kind of madness of crowds, especially you can slink into anonymity and uh, mm -hmm. the gospel is all about freeing you from the madness of crowds and allowing you to recover your true personhood, which is where you can actually be kind of co-creative and participating in God's design for you on this life. And it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, you know, I think the Bible is the key to all knowledge. I think it's the key to understanding how to call BS on a lot of nonsense that's considered to be untouchable in the world of science and culture. And uh, basically, Jesus models for us a way of having kind of like a social Aikido, a way of disarming the madness of crowds by allowing it to fall on its own inertia. And that's where you get the paradox of being wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. That's the kind of social Aikido that Jesus practices and models for us so that we can imitate it ourselves. And why that is important, that's important because we are set free from the bondage to decay. That's what the Bible talks about. And I think that's why it's important to get our biological and nutritional understanding in synchronicity with our physics. We need to get it all in alignment together so that we have a full package of what's going on under the hood of our minds and our bodies so that we're not just flailing around in the dark, reacting to whatever new psyop comes around, right? I mean, we should be very, yeah. we should be very, intentional on in how we look at this stuff absolutely yeah and um this is th this is something that i i talk about quite a bit um the 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 idea of animism is something that gets brought up a lot here um i'm sure you're somewhat aware with that it, it's it's uh it's a term that isn't used as much in academic anthropology anymore because it's just so broad that it doesn't have a lot of um a lot of academic applications, but the idea of uh, people and of animals and of places and objects having this energy uh, is something that I personally do believe in. It's it's also referenced in the Bible, um, this idea, maybe not as literally, but the idea of energy, the idea of ma mana is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and most early cultures have this idea. Um, you're you're getting way more into it than I'm personally aware of. When you say social Aikido, um, that that Aikido is a Japanese term, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's what what does that derided, mean? It's a it's much derided uh, martial art, I believe, on uh, on the internet because of uh, some of those elaborate videos people have where they come by and they do one finger and they knock three people over, you know, in the air. And they say, oh, you yeah. can't do that on the bar fight or whatever. And so I, I'm using it more because I just like the word, but uh, I'm not yeah. I'm not standing by the veracity of which is the ultimate martial art. I don't really have an opinion on that. But oh, what yeah. I am suggesting is that Aikido is a means of using the opponent's uh, momentum and inertia against itself, right? And so that's what the cross is fundamentally and everything Jesus did. Uh, but culminating in the cross was using his opponent's momentum to expose itself. What was the opponent? The mm. madness of crowds, if we want to keep it simple. The madness of the human's homo sapiens species in its attempt to try to create a kind of release from bad energy that's building up in a community. Okay? You can think of bad behavior like electrical charge energy that's starting to ping pong off of each other, and it has to discharge onto something, right? It's like it's like electrical energy has to have a, a, a ground, right? We understand this when we talk about electricity with lightning bolts and other things like that, and electrical engineering can tell us a lot about it. We should do that. We should have an electrical engineer to help us map this out on his wavelength. But, you know, basically, we have that same process going on with electromagnetic uh, 
energy within human beings. And like you said, spaces, I think everything has a magnetic frequency and your thought has a magnetic frequency, right? It has a vibration. Now, this is all very popular on TikTok and all the, you know, this is, so there's, there's a dumb way of looking at this that which gets applied, you know, in a kind of haphazard woo woo way where we talk about, yeah. you know, magnetism and I, my thoughts, I can collect a million dollars. If I think about it today, it'll come in the mail. Some of that gets a little bit woo woo. Right. But what I'm talking about is like the actual physics behind some of these intuitions that people popularly hold. Right. And, and right. I think that the scapegoat mechanism that you see represented in the cross where a community comes together, this guy is upsetting the apple cart of stability in some sense, He's upsetting the homeostasis of the organism of the collective community around it. He's trying to help them grow out of their zero-sum mindset, right, that's got them locked in corruption, locked in decay, disorder, disease, and tyranny. Ultimately, they're enslaved to another a group at the time he shows up in history. And what he does is he allows them to discharge that energy onto him instead of each other, and then he... Be, instead of resisting it, he allows it to collapse on its own way. So the, so it's like this. You have to look at what Peter says. Peter is his right-hand man. Peter's kind of like his second-in-command in the Scripture. He's the guy that's kind of verbalizing what a lot of the other guys are thinking in his apostles. And he says, when Jesus says he's going to go to the cross, he says, oh, come on, don't tell me you're going to go die on the cross. we got a great thing going here. We need to turn this into a political movement. Uh, we're going to get bumper stickers. We're going to storm the castle. We're going to get rid of all the corrupt Herod groups. We're going to get rid of the Roman occupiers. You've got a movement here, Jesus. You've got thousands of people at your beck and call. People want you to be the Messiah. Let's turn this into a political rule. And he says, get behind me, Satan. This is what Jesus responds. Get behind me. The accuser. What is the accuser? The accuser is not just what we conceive of in our kind of 2,000 years later as like a red-horned beast that we imagine is sitting on our, on our shoulder, the accuser is the madness of crowds, the violence of the mob. And what he's saying is it's the way in which society has found a, an ability to uh, create order out of chaos using a controlled act of violence. And he's, he's, he's appealing to something that goes back to the very origins of our species. Now, let me let me give you an example. The ritual that he uses to inaugurate his new world order, his new world movement that will cut against the way of scapegoating is communion. He says, eat my body, drink my blood, do this in remembrance of me, right? And what's interesting about that is he's calling, as you would know as an anthropologist, he's calling back to mind something that people in his immediate audience and people before and after don't want to deal with, which is that the origins of our of our sense of the sacred oftentimes are tied back to ritual cannibalism, right? So he's saying he's he's called he's he's satirizing he's opening up the veil of humanity's sense of the sacred in that statement. It's very ironic. It's rich with irony, and he's saying in order to defeat your zero sum minds that has you locked in eternal cyclical views of 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 wor of the world which are tied to the seasons eternally, tied to repeating sacrifice in order to stave off d bad energy and discharging it onto a common victim like you have, you have to imitate me and eat me. In John 6, that when he says, eat me, it pisses everybody off. They're confused. They don't understand what he's talking about. The word he's using there, uh, a theologian named Michael Harden points out, it's like basically the word for gnawing on the bone of, of, the, of the marrow of meat. I mean, he's talking about the real gritty, visceral description of what you would say devouring in a cannibalistic way would look like. And he's doing yeah. that in order to show you how to break from the matrix of religion. So to, to, to be an atheist, to be a true atheist, you have to be a Christian. You have to exit the eternal return of religion and find the future. I mean, it's the most amazing thing in the world, really. Uh, wow. I've never actually, th I've never thought about it that way. That That's, that's absolutely incredible. But so I, uh get behind me satan and it has this added benefit and and this is kind of what what you were already talking about of you know acting in a way that is uh that, that is relatable to people who are practicing this idea at the time because 
uh, ritual cannibalism is something I bring up all the time. People misunderstand cannibalism very often. They they misunderstand cannibalism as this thing that you know they have this idea of like there's the the law of the sea where people are eating each other in certain cases where sailors are marooned or something. They have the law of the sea. That's a separate thing. That's for survival. That that's not ritualistic cannibalism, which. Ritualistic cannibalism as an idea of eating another person for their power, either a defeated enemy or yeah. somebody who dies in their own society or who yeah. is sacrificed, is is something that happens through ritual in order to consume their spiritual power. And it existed on every continent besides Antarctica, unless, you know, maybe there's something in Antarctica we don't know about. Maybe there's something below the ice. But, you know, every continent, it's not just, you know, I post some stuff about ritualistic cannibalism on New Guinea. And then people are like, oh, like there, there's like racist comments about people from New Guinea. And I'm like, no, you're missing the point. Like, that, that's not what it is. Th this is something that existed in all societies um, yeah. in the past. You always want to quarantine that into some other race or some other group because they don't want to admit how close to home it is to their own, you know, human heart, really, is that cannibalism still exists in a sublimated way, right? When the form of hyper-competition, right? In the idea of like trying to consume, you know, when John Lennon was shot, the guy was a super fan. He wanted, he said, I wanted to be John Lennon. And I thought if I could kill him, I was like becoming him, right? So that's a, like wow. a vestige psychologically of the same kind of, not in all cases, but much a, a very similar yeah. pattern as you would see in anthropology. Uh, of ritual cannibalism, trying to become that which you devour, right? Taking the life right. of, yeah. And th and then, <laughs> so that reminds me of another thing. This, um, like, you, you know, you see, I've seen this talked about, I'm a huge comedy fan. I've seen this talked about in comedy before, where there's like, a, is somebody, these lower comics, they want to cancel higher comics. This is years ago. This doesn't really happen anymore, but they want to uh, take away the position of a comic who's above them in on the social hierarchy for their own opportunities, and and that's that's a similar thing. It's it's a cannibalization. It's in a it's uh, consuming their energy and consuming their position. Um, but oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, please. I, I'm more interested say, in what you have to say. Back here. into the Ray P thing. You know, I postulate this is something I'm working on. So I know some people would say. When you're cooking a new theory or something, keep it secret until you got it all cleaned up. But And that's generally a good idea. But some of these things are just so fun and intuitive. I just have to share them with programs and my own show as I'm thinking it through. But I, I have a thought, because Ray Pete talks about the thyroid a lot. He was a biologist. For those who are not familiar with Ray Pete, uh, he was a nutritional uh, kind of dissident, a biologist. He pioneered the problem of PUFA and seed oils and went really farther than a lot of folks in uh, nutritional guru worlds would, would go in terms of really getting to the heart of our metabolic dysfunction. But fundamentally, here's something interesting I want you to think about. Thyroid used to be a part of human uh, diet, right? You would eat the food. It was, I think it was the 1940s, the United States government banned. You had to remove the thyroid gland from animals that you were going to sell for the, to the public to eat. They literally banned it so that they could try to create drugs to uh, kind of synthetically reproduce the effects of consuming thyroid. But wow, you used to, yeah, you used to. You, it's illegal still to this day to sell thyroid, the thyroid gland, to the public. So when you go to your butcher, uh, you know, at your grocery store, maybe your local small town butcher would be a little bit more friendly. But go up to him if you want to scare him and say, "Hey, you don't have to have any." Uh, uh, that good old thyroid in the back, do you? And watch, oh, dear God, I can't sell you that. That's not for human consumption. You know, they get real sketchy like you're asking for some kind of secret, you know, sketchy substance. Yeah. Uh, but what's going on there is, uh, well, there's maybe a lot of reasons for that. But one thing I want to focus on is the simple fact that we used to we used to get a lot of thyroid supplement in our diets because when you would cook the whole chicken, you would cook the organs too, which included the thyroid. They didn't have it removed. And if it is same thing for other fish head soup has a lot of thyroid in it and all these traditional ways of consuming the animal would allow, especially if you're cooking in a pot would allow, would allow the release of a lot of animating, energetically uh, exciting thyroid uh, molecules like T3, which is the active form of thyroid. 
And when you're eating that, a lot of times people notice when they supplement thyroid as a medicine to this day, that they feel they're in more in touch with their heart. They feel more euphoria, right? And they and the doctors will tell you, stop taking it if you feel euphoria. And Ray Pete often says, well, that's how you know the medical establishment is not pro-human because they call it a disease or a problem if you feel euphoric. It's like there's something wrong with you, you know, as opposed to right. like, you should feel joy and you, you should want to feel that as a natural state. So what I'm trying to point at is, Think about this for a moment. Ritual cannibalism, you're cooking the human in a pot. You're going to get a ton of thyroid in there, which when you're hungry or stressed and you're in a state of adrenaline as you're maybe dismembering a common victim, uh, you're going to feel an ecstatic release from that stress state with the consumption of the thyroid gland, which would be in the pot. I know this is gruesome, but you're thinking about massive amounts of T3 being released in the soup you're going to get a huge surge in dopamine, which is just one of many kind of, in my opinion, chemical effects that take place with that ancient form of ritual cannibalism, this release of stress, right? That's what I kind of want to emphasize here is that the, 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 the ancient world dealt in a, in a large way with a lot of forms of stress, malnutrition, uh, you know, lack of uh, abundant sources of food in certain areas of the world lack of technology to effectively, you know, bypass some of the seasonality that we take for granted now that we've bypassed. All these things contribute to a high stress environment, especially when you could be victim of a raid that where you're going to be assaulted and harmed and taken over and conquered and violently uh, harmed if you don't uh, play ball. This is a, a level of stress that I think a lot of people in the modern world don't have any way of really comprehending most of us. But this is something go. that was the status quo for a lot of people in the ancient world. And I think when that stress becomes so powerful, when it becomes, especially in times of a famine or a plague, when scarcity is really rife, that bad blood energy that I talked about earlier, that bad negative energy of competition, blaming, shaming one another, being paranoid of one another, all of that needs to find a safe conduit of discharge. And that's where the scapegoat mechanism would be so psychologically inviting for people, right? You, uh, it's very easy. And you got to also think about it from the, from the brain standpoint. Ian McGilchrist, a, neuro, a neuroscientist, he talks about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and how they, they function differently in the brain. And I think the left hemisphere he talks about is more good at identifying uh, in a sea of sameness, a something I, that could be pulled out of the out of the sea of sameness. So, for example, to use this as an illustration, the chicken or the bird looking down with his left hemisphere, he's able to look for a seed amongst a sea of pebbles that looks similarly shaped. His brain's able to identify and isolate something out of the sea of sameness that looks slightly different. The right hemisphere has got the holistic picture in mind. It's got, it's thinking about the birds. It's thinking about the weather. It's thinking about the mag. It's feeling the magnetic field of the flock of birds around it. If it's chicken, and it's identis, it's it's trying to holistically gather all of that painting together. The left hemisphere is able to separate, isolate, and identify the seed and peck. They work together in an orchestral way. But my point is, I think that has something to do with what happens with these sacrificial lynchings, these scapegoat murders that Gerard right. is talking about. L lynching has... being, sorry to interrupt, but lynching has a racial connotation in the United States. But really, it's it's just a lynching in its traditional definition means a mob vigilante justice or some other thing against somebody. It doesn't yeah, originally have that context. Yes. Yeah, emulation. And emulation can happen in a spontaneous form, and it can also happen in a ritual form, right? And the ritual right. was designed to maintain and stop the spontaneous form from firing off too much, right? And that's what right. that's where the that's where the priests and everybody introduced the ritual form of sacrifice as a means to staving off the more spontaneous populace that sacrifice which uh, get messy. yes it's yeah. a standardization of this because and you still see this in a lot of places in um in Af africa is a very large place but in africa they they have this thing today they in a lot of countries they call it burning it's vigilante justice where 
they'll uh, they'll put a tire around somebody and light it on fire, and it's yeah. it's a it's a spontaneous ritualistic. Um, well, spontaneous. It is ritualistic, but it's not ritualistic in the other sense. It's ritualistic in the sense that it happens in a certain way, but it does come from a. Um, it does come from a, a randomized, uh, yeah. a, an almost random, spontaneous and that, group. And that, that's where we get the idea of why so many countries and places around the world, for a variety of reasons, but fundamentally, they they have a harder time accelerating past just the basics of infrastructure. It's because they're constantly trying to stave off through whatever type of policing and governmental enforcement, a kind of mob violence popping off, right? Because mob mm -hmm. violence can end up spiraling into civil war and chaos, right? Because if you if you have mob vengeance in mind and you go after somebody and you tear them apart in the streets, if you pick a guy or a girl who has a lot of friends and family, they're going to come and get revenge, right? And so right. that's not something that a society that doesn't have the infection of the Christ story in it can handle too much, which is why so much of their governance is just trying to stave off mob violence from being unleashed. And yes. they don't have the luxury of the gospel. The gospel allows the luxury of a society to build high trust in ritual that is actually built into customs and habits. You open the door for somebody if somebody is of a different ethnicity in America and they're on fire, you try to help them. You know, you get a fire extinguisher. That's high right. trust society. We we take for granted that's an inheritance of the gospel, which allows a community to go above and beyond just considerations for family and kin, but to actually create a common good that takes care of even the the, the person who is considered to be the outsider in other communities. And uh, we're spoiled brats. We're so richly inherited of the gospel, and we have no idea how much of it is built into the very fabric of everything we take for granted in this society. And we say, oh, we don't need this. That's a, that's a, that's a fairy tale. No, that's the fairy tale. You know, the idea that we just decided to uh, spontaneously, you know, develop these habits of higher society and, and conscientiousness and high trust in a vacuum. That's a total fantasy. Never happened. No. <laughs> yeah, it's rooted in Christianity. And like you saw my thread I wrote recently, which was a bunch of quotes from the founding fathers about the um the uh the how integral Christianity uh was to the creation of the United States and some of them even saying that it only works with a Christian people. Um which, which of course is, you know, people bring up the the freedom of religion first amendment, which is a separate thing. It's it's that's about the creation of uh, the something similar to the Anglican Church or the First Estate, which is an institutionalized uh, form of religious power. That that's a separate thing. That that that's a corruption. That that's that is a problem. But that doesn't mean that the people themselves don't need to have this uh, this commitment to this set of uh, ancestral ideas that allows them to continue yeah. working within the society. Um, yeah. Just like Richard Dawkins and Elon Musk recently have both said that they're cultural Christians. They don't believe in the metaphysical claims of Christianity, but they believe in the values of Christianity. I would consider that a prerequisite to having a kind of civilized order like we've come to enjoy relative to other countries around the world, which are, again, are just constantly trying to stave off the madness of crowds, right? That's what yeah. Christianity is, what allows us to technologically evolve outside of just trying to stave off the madness of crowds with an antidote of sacrificial ritual. And that's why it's important yes. for us to take these matters seriously and not be fools. You know, Richard Dawkins and those folks just really know nothing about anthropology. They don't have a clue, you know, <laughs> they don't even know anything yeah. about biology either, but that's enough. And that's something... That's something I talk about a lot with uh, a, lo a lot of what I do is I criticize uh, modern academia and modern academia is great for a lot of ways. You know, I, I spend a lot of time reading anthropology articles, um, articles from from other people, but like uh, created by so academic peer reviewed, whatever peer reviewed in theory, not in practice a lot of the times, which is a separate thing. But, you know, I think they have their pros, but it's a lot of it is so compartmentalized. It's so compartmentalized into their individual fields. And anthropology itself is better than most at this. It's quite a holistic field. They do work with other field 
fields, but mostly most fields, they're so compartmentalized into their own field, their own methods that they don't see the big picture in a lot of ways, or at least the, the, the academic academia in general does not see the big picture when you take the sum of all of its, its parts that have been, that these professors have been taught to work within the methods of their one field. And they'll work with other fields a little bit, but they're, they're, it's, it's like a cage towards their thinking when in reality, religion and all of the, all of the aspects of humanity are holistic. They, they work with each other. The, the, the politics, um, the politics, society, religion, they, they all work together. At least they, they did in the past. Um, an example yeah, of this. All, yeah, yeah they're all synonymous, really. Religion and society and culture are synonymous. I mean, religion means uh, in the Latin to bind together, right? So what binds a nation together is the shared story of who they are, where they came from, where they're going, and what do they value? You know, why are they here? The why questions. And media needs to stop doing a lot of time on what and start asking the why questions, you know, and that includes everybody. We all need to think about the why questions because those are the things that really matter. The what is almost almost superfluous sometimes, you know. You spend people spend so many time so much time thinking about the what, and that's fine, but we should always anchor it with the why. Why why is this the way it is? Yeah. You know? And, why and do we this, have the values we do? I mean, we have a, there's a there's a place over in Tampa. I don't know if it's still there, but I used to get my uh, I used to get milk fresh from the farm there, you know. And I remember that guy would just have a a, a bucket open for you to you know retrieve your milk, raw milk, and put the money in the bucket, you know. And it was out there for anybody to take, and it was a trust system. And people think that that just pops up in a vacuum. How stupid could you possibly be? You think that just pops up from the scientific method that he scientifically inherited like some kind of like brotherhood of man and some human humanism sense or something. And that's where he gets this kind of cultural expectation that this can even work in other cultures, the, the bucket would be taken and the, and the milk would be taken and everything else. If it was left for you to freely take as, as you will. Now, a lot of people are arrogant. They don't want to submit to the imitation of Christ in their hearts. And so they say it's a race thing that allows this to happen or that thing. And I think that's, again, it's just a cop out people, you know, yeah. every tribe and tongue will confess that Christ is Lord at the end of history. And uh, there will be no segregation in the kingdom of heaven on earth as it comes to so heaven is colliding yeah. into earth. It's coming into earth and it's not coming from, from up from, from like the sky down. It's coming from within us. Right. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven is within you all. It's plural. So Tolstoy said it's, the kingdom of God is within you and it's in the individual sense, but he's actually, Jesus is actually saying the plural for you, the kingdom of, of heaven is within you all or within y'all. <laughs> yeah. South. Yeah. 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 And so that's where that, so it's this idea of like our choices were restored. Romans five says that Christ is the new Adam and he does much greater than the first Adam. What does that mean? That means he is implementing a reversal of the effects of the fall of man, including our bondage to decay. Romans, yeah, I'll read you a passage, Romans chapter 8, verse 21. It says, uh, well, see, I'll, I'll go to verse 20. It says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So the creation, the Bible says, creation, like you were talking about, animism or whatever, right? This energetic order that we've been given the keys to the kingdom with is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed such that the sons of God can set it free from its bondage to decay. Now, the way to look at that is, one. there's a lot of layers to it, but very simply, the bondage to decay is talking about death anxiety, that human beings are the only people who are aware of our, uh, our the only species that we seem to know our death is, is coming in the sense of, like, we can conceptualize it, 
as you know, maybe the animal feels death coming upon them and then prepares for it by getting into a, a quiet space in the cave. You know, I mean, we get that, right? But we're the only species we know of that seems to become aware of the finitude of our existence, and then we act out accordingly from that anxiety. That's what the Bible's talking about when it talks about the bondage to decay. It's the entire way in which we operate, our minds, our bodies, everything we do is locked under this death anxiety. Well, the reason why Christ resurrects, and he doesn't do it on the public square, by the way, because he, that would be too easy. If we knew that all we had to, if we, if he had, if he had waited till CNN and Fox News could have live streamed his resurrection, we wouldn't have ever emulated his way of setting us free from the bondage to decay. Does that make sense? He had to make the resurrection a private affair, such that it had to be passed down by those who followed and imitated his way through the church, through history. Right? If he made it too easy, that, in other words. Human beings have this tendency to be like, well, if he's Hercules, then I'm going to follow him because he's the tough guy. He can break death. And then you're imitating Jesus for the wrong ways, which means you're not imitating Jesus. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? He wants you to follow. He wants to. He wants you to love your neighbor and lay down your life for others, not just check a box that says, "Well, tell me who's God. Is it is it who Zoroaster said, or is it who is it Hercules? Is it Marduk?" Who is God? Oh, it's Jesus. Okay, well, I'll say my prayers and eat my vitamins every night and think about that guy as the big boss man in the sky. Well, th that's not what Christianity is about, right? That's what a lot of people think Christianity is about. It's just another religion. Who is, this one says it's this God. This one says it's that God. But it turns out it's a guy named Jesus. And that's why, yeah, you know, say your prayers and submit uncle, you know, like, uh, like uh, you know, so it's like basically Islam, what people have created Christianity to be in their minds. It's just all about, you know, you know, there's a big guy and who's his name? Is it Uncle Bill? No. Is it Uncle Who? Who is it? Who's the big tough guy? Tell me who the big boss man is and I'll pay my tithe to him and he'll take care of me every time <laughs> I get sick. You know, it's like, what is this? This is a mafia don? Well, that's how Christianity on, oftentimes gets distilled into, unfortunately. And that's not true. Like, Jesus wants you to become like him, which is why he didn't make his resurrection on blast in front of like the Roman pantheon, because then it would be too easy. You'd be like, okay, anybody who can come out of that tomb, that's the big dude. I'm going to follow him. Yeah. Okay. He waited only to the people who actually had to get broken to the point where they betrayed him when he was being murdered and, and, and tortured Peter, right? All those people, they sold him out. He revealed himself to them. See, he waited till they were broken, that they had faced the madness of the crowd, and they had submitted to it, totally humiliated, and then he showed up to them. And that's what turned their lives around to the point that they were willing to go to their death, spreading the truth of what they had seen, the resurrected Lord Jesus. It's because they were so enlivened by the reality of the event that they were willing to record every one of them that they totally got it wrong, even though they followed him for three years straight. They sold him out. Even Peter, who was supposed to be the toughest of them all, sold him out when it was when it was push come to shove, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Different I I love what you're saying. You you lost me a little bit. I mean, I I I, I think I'm getting what you're saying. I'm, I'm trying to go fast because we have limited time. I'm sorry, I should slow. No, 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 no. No, you do you you <laughs> Or I, I shouldn't say you lost me. I think I get what you're saying, but I lost my ability to respond by concentrating on what you're saying. That that's what I meant. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes that way, happens. By yeah. the way, you always know a good leader by how good of a listener you are. And I watch you doing the way you're taking notes and stuff. That's a true listener. That's how leadership looks, folks. Just want to point that out. The mastery. Yeah. I'm telling you, the mastery of good leadership is being able to be a keen listener. That, and that's and you're demonstrating that by the way by fully engaging in the and it's the, most people are just always waiting this when someone's talking they're just waiting to say what they wanted to say they're not thinking about what their other guy's talking about yeah that that, that that's a problem that I've definitely recognized in myself in the past but I'm also going to turn that around on you because I would say that good leadership as well is like you know I'm here and I'm listening to you, and then you turn that around and you tell me I'm the good leader. No, I think you're the better leader. I, I think that's 
Well, That's pretty clear there's here. Zero sum. There's all leaders in the kingdom of heaven. You can... <laughs> Absolutely. No, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say there's different types of leadership and, yeah. um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I just I, I just appreciate it because it's very few times I've ever been on a show where someone's writing or whatever you're doing. I don't know if you're drawing in the sand or what, but uh, <laughs> it's a really good way of engaging the person talking, and it's very helpful. Yeah. So, you know, just to talk about that for a moment, what I found is that if I don't take notes – then I I have more of the because I know I need to respond so I need to be thinking about things I'm going to respond to and if I don't mm. take notes then I'm going to concentrate less on what the person is saying but if I take notes That's then true. I have notes on on what I can ask about unfortunately now I've taken so many notes um, that I I I don't know what I want to ask about and I don't want to go back too far um, but what I can always do is go back. I have plenty of things I want to ask about. So I think we reached the natural conclusion of that conversation. That was an incredible end to that. Um, the release of death anxiety is incredibly important. And I don't think that's something that gets talked about enough. I really don't. I, I think that um, in modern society has this way of just pushing aside the spiritual aspect of being a human. Everything is material. Everything is uh, about numbers on a spreadsheet and about, you know, uh, increasing quarterly profits and all the related things individually that you can have. You know, uh, human rights, the the things that people concentrate are, oh, it's... it's <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying right now. I know what I'm saying, but I I, I don't know how to how to actually bring it out. No, you're right. Man, man, our culture is is built on this dead matter ideology that there's dumb dead atoms, and um, and that you know basically it's some big other acts upon those atoms and creates magic, right? And so you have. If the big other for the Darwinists or neo-Darwinists would be like a random mutation, you know, it's like this big other that stimulates, it's like a jackpot. It's enough random and enough time and enough randomness can create some kind of magic out of dumb dead atoms called life. Um, yeah. The other it's a one stupid is, idea uh, to me, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Another one is the dumb view of, well, I just, we'll call it dualism. Um and dualism is, you know, the separation of mind and body as some kind of like distinct spheres, right? And from there, and Descartes and other folks were good on that, talking about mind-body dualism. There's the mind, and then there's the body, right? And then you have, uh, and that's where you get this weird distinction between like the natural world and culture. Okay, well, we have our biological self, and then we have our culture self, right? And never the two shall mix, we're told, right? Because God forbid we allow natural ideas to percolate in our sense of culture, then we'll be admitting that our elites are probably ruled, are very eugenicists and very, you know, much, you know, very scary uh, people, neo Malthusians that we don't like. Um, so we don't want to acknowledge that. So we pretend like there's this hard distinction between nature and uh, culture. So again, mind body, totally distinct. And I think Christianity totally rejects that. It, it, Christianity is not pantheistic. It's not that there's nothing but matter. Uh, it's not dualistic in the sense that there's mind and body, heaven and earth, totally distinct. It is uh, kind of like panentheism, which is the idea of man, mind and uh, mind and uh, matter intertwined together. So there's a kind of inbreaking yeah. of heaven, heaven and earth, kind of colliding together, right? The unseen so, and the seen, the energetic world and the structural world of material. Absolutely. Right? And and this comes back to what I was talking about before with this uh, compartmentalization of things. I, I think that it doesn't just apply in academia. It applies in all aspects of our culture. Uh, th this idea of the, the compartmentalization, when I talk about it, is usually in academia, and it shows up beginning in like the early modern period it doesn't show up until you know protestantism 1500s um i i think there is a is a tie to protestantism but i'm not saying directly and only protestantism in the 1500s but the the compartmentalization of of things into these separate parts 
is massive in how we think about everything when really uh if you look at physics and things are they're they're all reacting and they are they're they're working with each other and all other things there isn't a compartmentalization of everything and i i think that that's one of the fundamentally big picture macro biggest issues we have in our society today yeah, um, i think that i think that the that that comes from from a left hemisphere bra left brain hemisphere dominance in our society ian mcgilchrist who i mentioned earlier is really good about that he wrote a book called the master and his emissary which is about how the right brain of our the right hemisphere of our brain is actually the master of of how we 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 typically have thought that the left brain is really the dominant part of our brain and it's what's good for numbers and math and language and logic and the right brain we're told is this creative uh wild child and it's kind of like it's kind of like the weirdo section of us and our childlike self and it's actually not true the right brain is actually the dominant brain but our society has is in some sense is in McGill Chris uh, mind a kind of conspiracy of the left hemisphere overthrowing the right hemisphere's proper place in part of the picture and here's why it matters for what you're saying if we have that left brain hemisphere dominance way out of proportion to the right hemisphere which integrates intuition which is actually just another word of talking about the sense uh, i would say a magnetic sense right of of our of our whole picture the holistic picture as we would say when we lose that right hemisphere processing we're stuck with this left hemisphere approach which ultimately is obsessed with categorization just like the chicken looking for the seed amongst the little pebbles that look just like the seed but it's slightly different that's what that left hemisphere is mm. always good about so right now Here's how you know your left hemisphere is, is firing away right now. Well, there's a lot of ways. The left hemisphere is not evil. But if you're going too far with it, it's when you need to categorize someone when they're talking. So you might be watching me right now in the audience, and you might say, well, he mentioned Jesus. Is he a Jesus freak? What is he? Is he a libertarian? What is he? I can't figure him out. Is he right wing? You're trying to, that's your left hemisphere dominance going too far. Woo -woo 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 -woo. Trying yeah. to figure out what am I? Am I a sunflower seed? Is this sunflower? Because that's what is that? That's a stress response to not to the unknown right and when someone's mm. just talking from their heart you're trying to label them in, into an ideological camp so you can handle it and that's that's caused by stress metabolism right when we get our yeah. thyroid I'm, I'm gonna tie it right back to ray p when we get our thyroid in high function then we can tap into that right brain hemisphere part of ourselves which sees things more holistically which is more in a state of joy when someone's different or weird you're not freaked out trying to label and categorize them and separate them as a friend or enemy that's that binary thinking comes along when you are in a state of chronic stress because of your environment because of trauma because of poor diet 99 percent of the american people probably are in a state of impaired thyroid function regardless of their age because of the massive amount of PUFA, the seed oil that we eat it's a highly unstable molecule. So thinking about it like a, uh, uh, thinking about it like magnets, you know, magnets like to typically, if you watch magnets and play around with them, they like to form a stable, neutralized structure. You, two bar magnets, if they if you play with them, they'll tend to go to their opposite poles, right? So the positive will will sync up with the negative of the other magnet and vice versa, right? And what's going on there? It, it, magnetism. The magnetic particles have a tendency to want to find a neutral, stable structure, right? And that's what's going on with our, our situation today is that we are always, because we eat these violent, vicious, unstable molecules like seed oils, they are highly charged, volatile, magnetically charged particles of fat that go into our body. They were never meant to be fuel and they're unnatural in the amounts that we eat them. And what they do is they make a wreckage of all of our tissue, which prefers stable structures. They're unstable, and they cause hell. They magnetically charge and attract to different particles, and they create unstable byproducts when they're processed as fuel. So our body doesn't want to use them. It wants to store them as fat, typically, which is why we have a preponderance of obesity after introducing industrial, industrial seed oil into the diet. Uh, but that's not the only way they wreck our bodies. They also cause 
depression, bipolar disorder, mental illness of various types. They create psoriasis, Alzheimer's, dementia. Cancer is a big problem, diabetes, heart disease. All of these things are product of an inflamed state. And most of the inflammation that people are experiencing in the modern world can be laid at the feet of the introduction of cheap industrial seed oils by our government, which has subsidized them to make them so cheap, you almost have to eat them because you can't, if you're on a typical family, working two jobs, you got kids, you're trying to get them into this or that or whatever, you end up just grabbing whatever the store shelf has. And unfortunately, a lot of the best natural food stores are selling trash seed oil foods uh, because they're dirt cheap, even in their organic form. And those things are extremely mm. inflammatory, and that's what's causing people's mental stupor. And so what people need to do is figure out how to heal their thyroid, reverse their serotonin dependence. Remember, serotonin is marketed to us as the happy molecule. Serotonin is what we're supposed to embrace. All these SSRI drugs that school shooters are on, they're all I increasing their serotonin. Serotonin has a way of numbing you out from the sensations of life which is God's design, right? God designed serotonin, if you're in a state of high stress, to numb you out from some of that, to kind of help you cope with that. But to artificially increase it with this highly toxic diet and environment that we're all in, creates serotonin dependence to the point where serotonin can become so bad it creates psychotic violent aggression, which is what you see with school shooters, by the way, who are on these SSRIs which inflame the serotonin problem and don't heal the thyroid. They impair the thyroid. So we've got it all backwards. You can think of, you can think of when we're born, as I say in my article, America needs a, a Ray Pete summer. Um, you, you, can see that our, our, you can say that our bodies were born with a high thyroid function. That's why we're gregarious, we're intuitive, we're creative, we're imaginative. Jesus said, such is the kingdom of these. That's giving you a clue that their high thyroid function is where most adults need to get back to and build on it with the wisdom and knowledge of age, right? And that's part of fighting off death anxiety. That's, what's, that's, that's part of getting past the stress state that Jesus' kingdom of heaven is all about so that you get into that abundant state, the win-win state. Think about it. Let me tell you something. If you had your body physiologically in tune, and maybe it already is, because I don't, you know, I'm just, but I'm just saying you in the general sense. Yeah. You're going to feel so gregarious. You're going to feel so joyful. You're not going to care when somebody who's a rival of yours wins. You're going to say more wins for everybody. A win-win mindset, an abundance mindset. That's what leadership looks like. That's why people are drawn to leaders who emulate that. You mentioned earlier that you thought it was a show, a sign of leadership that I said something positive about you being a leader. It's a win-win mindset when there's not one person is the best, when everybody can win, not in a fake superficial little merit badge, fake version, but in true excellence for everybody. Not everybody yeah. can be an excellent engineer, but somebody right. can. Not everybody can be an excellent podcaster, but somebody can. Not everybody, you know, there's there's room for everybody. That's a gregarious right. thyroid mindset. And another thing that I talk about a lot here, and I was just talking about this with uh, Daniela uh, Pasternak uh, for the episode last week. I'm not sure when exactly this episode will be, but um, the there's like a single track towards success in Western culture today. There's like, you know, you have to go to college, you have to uh, get a good job at, at this position. Whereas in in past societies, there there's there's a there's different tracks for for you to go on and a lot of our problems i think come from everybody everything needing to be standardized for there being a single track for success you have to sit down in this classroom if you're not sitting down in this classroom well enough if you're not an eight-year-old boy who wants to sit still for eight hours then you're there's something wrong with you you need to be on drugs that type of thing you know but in the past there was differences there's a specific example I would have is something like what we would call schizophrenia in modern society. In a lot of early societies, p these people would have uh, these ways of interacting with the world that they would recognize in early societies as very different for everyone else. So they're not going to have the same track as most of the people in that society. It's going to be 
understood as a gift or some other word I've seen in ethnography to describe it as a gift. But what they're going to do is they have positions in that society that are made for that person to be able to interact with the world in a way that makes sense with the way that they see the world in their different way. And with that, they're going to have a position. So a lot of shamans in past societies were actually people that would be diagnosed with schizophrenia today, and they would be locked in a sterile room, and they would be uh, you know, institutionalized in ways that would not help them at all. And then there's you know, past societies. We don't have nuns anymore. We don't have... Um, we don't like the priesthood is not considered a, a path for a lot of people anymore. There, it's compartmentalized into a single track for, for everybody, men and women, everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. And I think that's just part of the left hemisphere. I, I, there's different layers to look at it, but I think that's part of the left brain hemisphere dominance of our society. Another way of looking at it is it's part of our stress-induced me metabolic dysfunction in our society. And then another way of looking at it which is throws a monkey wrench into keeping it too simple, which is that this is part of the Christian inheritance, right? Is that the Christian inheritance opens up in, in early societies, like you mentioned, everybody's kind of tracked for one position, right? Usually whatever their family does, right? Or whatever, you know, they kind of have their position and there's no, there's not a lot of fluidity of jobs, right? Today we take for granted that we say to a little child, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a rocket scientist. Okay, go do it. You know, what the heck? That's not at all what the early, early civilizations had, right? Because they didn't want a lot of fluidity in terms of like roles, because that's where rivalry can open up. And they didn't have a mechanism for dealing with rivalry like Christ provides. And so they would create a lot of differentiated structures and boundaries with taboos to reinforce don't going past the, not going past your station in life so that you yeah. didn't get out of line and get into competition. That's one of the reasons why like tragedy in the Greek, the Greek culture, the tragedy was a way of reminding the little peasants to stay in their lane, right? Because they'd watch somebody go really high and then fall down. And it was like, okay, this is what happens when you go too far. You can reach for the stars or, or reach for the moon and fall amongst the stars or whatever the saying is. Right. And so, this idea of like, this is a tragedy that this person went too far and challenged the gods' fates. And at the end of the day, they got their comeuppance and they were expelled or they were defeated or what have you. And that was a way for letting the society know that this is not a fluid structure. Stay in your lane and keep sweeping the stables or you're not going to be empire. You're not going to be a governor. Right. You're not going to be a rich person. You stay in your lane. That's what your fate was by a point of your of your birth, right? And it also creates because a, a lot of human nature is not about your absolute position. It's it's about your relative position and the way that you think about it. And it, it creates in that society uh, um, the the opposite of chaos. It creates a acceptance of people, which in a very real sense, when people are accepting of their position, like, you know, I'm. If if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to be a rocket scientist, a doctor, an NBA player, the president, any anybody that I ever knew in my life, and I was not a poor kid, you know, I'm a middle class Connecticut, which means upper middle class, you know, so nobody that I ever went to school with was ever going to be president. That's not how it works. Everybody that becomes president, they go to private schools, they go to an Ivy League school, they become president. It it is a track for those people. It, it's it's a lie that this is that this is fluid, but. When there's this uh, this cultural idea that you can do this and then you try and you can't, that creates disorder and it creates misery. Whereas, you know, me in my life, I was, you know, I was rebelling like any other suburban kid in thinking, oh, I'm going to have a life different than my dad, all this stuff. No, I ended up doing exactly what my dad did. I ended up going to the military, getting out trying some things. Now I do finance and I got a history degree just like my dad did. The exact thing. And I'm very happy about that now. I think that's perfect. But I, I would have lost a lot of uh, a lot of wasted time thinking that pushed by culture and media and the, the fiction, Hollywood, these things that our brain cannot tell the difference between real and fake. It doesn't matter that it's fiction. 
your brain can't tell the difference. Your brain reads that and it it takes in that information, excuse me, as it's as it's real. And I would have been a lot better off if I lived in a society that promoted the idea that you're okay doing like the the idea that's that's pushed in country music, you know, older country music. Like um uh little bitty life is okay. That that that's that type of thing. Um, yeah, and then Christianity provides for that. But what Christianity does is it does open up a radical, radical sense of free agency, right? And that, when again, unanchored from the wisdom and humility of imitating Christ, looks like a bunch of spoiled brats who think they're entitled to be a billionaire on account of whatever, you know, some unachieved, you know, status or success that they think that they're entitled to. And that is where you get the resentments coming in. Well, it's because I'm I'm this race. It's because I'm that gender. It's because I'm this or that. That's what's holding me back. So yeah, it's totally resentment, totally uh, uh, envy, right? But the Bible, you know, when you anchor wisdom to the Bible and particularly Jesus as the role model, then you realize all we like sheep have gone astray, each into our own way. And I always think that's kind of like an irony, right? Because you know, all we like sheep have gone into our own way. Well, sheep think they're going their own way in their own way, but they're just following the next guy in front of them off of a cliff, perhaps, right? Yeah. And that's kind of the wisdom of Jesus is like learning that you are a sheep in your desires. You imitate so much of what you think you want from those around you, good or bad. And that the moment you don't believe that, when you don't believe you're a sheep is when you're most like a sheep blindly following somebody off of a cliff like a sheep would do without a shepherd, right? So that's the whole point. You follow the shepherd. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. You follow me, and I will guide you and allow you to become yourself. That's what Soren Kierkegaard said. Going back to Soren, he said, with God's help, I will become myself, right? To become more in the likeness of Christ means you get to participate in the divine nature of the Trinity, which is indwelling in every fiber of the being of the universe, right? And that's a fascinating thing, right? Isn't that amazing? You know, Jesus is so it's so important for getting all of this stuff much more uh, anchored into reality and in and, and science barely catching up. But that's what our job is to try to help get these disciplines back in order a little bit. But you're right, you know, but there is a, there is a radical, there is a, a radical fluidity to this, right? Because Nikola Tesla comes in as an immigrant. That would be the lowest end of the totem pole in most societies in history. And yet he's able to empower the world with alternating current. Yeah, he gets screwed over a few times, but you know, we all do, right? But, <laughs> is that, but you see what I mean? Like to be able to power the world and just be a guy from another country, that's the Christian inheritance. That a man like that who would be considered forever an outsider and not given the opportunity of billionaires coming alongside them and working together and bringing them into high society and all that. You can't get that anywhere else, but a Christ haunted world. Yeah. Elon Musk who named yeah. his company after Tesla is another similar thing. I mean, he was, his family was, was quite wealthy in South yeah. Africa, but, but not, but he was near the top of South African society. That's very different from being now near the top of American society. It's it's a he massive says he has like increase. Asperger's or something, which in, in, in other societies in earlier life may have been used to marginalize him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To never a lot, yeah. Because he was neuro, what's the word they use? Neurotypical, neuro, neurodivergent. Yeah, or something, you know? So that would have yeah. been, that could have been, they could have locked him up as a, as like you said, an oracle or, or a shaman in, in, in earlier societies. And he would have never been able to uh, enact his own desires like he's been able to mm-hmm. do. Yeah. So, there, yeah. so thanks be to God that. So what I'm trying to get at is like, yeah, we don't want to demonize the past, which respected your lot in life. If you were designed to be a blacksmith, be a blacksmith. But with Christianity comes a radical openness that does allow for fluidity so that you can do something like something totally novel or different. And that's not evil and it's not bad. Yeah. But it doesn't and mean when you, that you combine should that middle, right? When you combine that with gratitude for what you have, I think exactly. it's it makes it okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's that harmony. It's wow. structure and energy harmonized together, right? That you can look at it that way. It's the energy, the metabolic energy of your mind and your dreams 
but with the structure of your family and the tradition and the, where they came from, all harmonizing together, body and soul. It's amazing how it all works. Yeah, it's a it's definitely a beautiful idea, and I think people are absolutely going to love this. Um, okay, so I know I know you have to go at three. Excuse me. Is there anything you want to end on? Is, is there anything specific you want to promote? Was there any lingering question or something that was a little bit on your mind that you didn't get? Mm. There's honestly so many things. I, I I wanted to bring up Michael Pollan's book, which is fine. Um, I don't know if you know Michael Pollan, but he's the guy who he wrote a book about the um about the the food industry that was what got me introduced to this um getting behind me satan i loved that um you know the the getting behind me satan thing is like is is allowing christianity to spread in a way that adopts the ideas of um it adopts the ideas of these these other societies in a way that you know, reduces this this ritualistic cannibalism. It gets rid of it, but it also does it in a way that people recognize. It, it's a way to to have effective proselyz- proselytization. Um, yeah, Jesus in, is in, not in a, a violent sense. revolutionary authoritarian. Okay, so right. That's like what the Old Testament some other religions is to preserve. The Old Testament is there to preserve the human grasping for God through history and showing how humans are failing and learning and growing up to the point of Christ, which is the culmination. Yeah. That's why you can't yeah. just that's why you can't just have a Christless Bible. We are not people of the book. That's Islam. That's other books. We're not the people of the book. We're the people of imitating Jesus. His life, not, not an ideology. When we get to the people of the book, that's where ideology pops up and starts directing us into these obsessions about well, did you know he did this? Did you know you can't have music in church? Did you know you had to do this? Do, 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 do. This obsession with ideology comes in. That's the stress. That's the stress mechanism that pollutes our mind and draws us away from what God told us to do. He was. He says we would do greater things than him. So once he restores us in the new Adam, that means he situates us back in the garden. And the garden is not there to be a prayer closet. It's there to be the launching point of subduing earth, aiming the dominion of earth into the point where we reduce its bondage to decay. That means being creative, being like God, being a co-creator. That's wow. the whole point. The osis, yeah. the osis, becoming like God. That's the purpose of being alive as a human being. You're to usher it in. And I think in the future, once we understand this, we will think creatively. So here's the homework for everybody. Get rid of the seed oils, do better to get your sleep, Get your carrot salad in every morning to help your endotoxin. Do these basic things that Ray Pete recommends. Read my article to learn about what some of the basics about what Ray Pete's all about. Get your biological, physiological self in order. Do the best. It's going to take a long time. This is not an easy fix. I'm not giving you a 60-day uh, uh, miracle program or something dumb. This is your life. It's, it's meant to be art. It's meant to be lived intentionally. And, and as you do that, let your creativity flourish. Paint, make movies, make music, make podcasts, make uh, whatever, animation, do something beautiful, or be an excellent plumber that everybody in the world talks about because you did better plumbing work, more creatively, more cost-effectively. You know what? We need a renaissance in blue-collar work because so many people think of the trades as the place where they get scammed. Somebody comes over and says, ma'am, you need this, you need that, you need this, and it's not true. So we need other people to say, ma'am, this is what you do need. This is what you do actually need, and I can do it in a better way than the people who are trying to scam people. The, The trade should be the place where the most honest Renaissance men are found, and they are there. But we need to start thinking about that better because we need to make things. We need to have anti-gravity right. technology. We need to have energy too cheap to meter. We need to have abundant solutions for, for illnesses like the big diseases I mentioned earlier that don't cost hardly anything. We need to understand the role of CO2 in our health. That's another thing I'll leave people to think about. I'm leaving things as like a uh, to-be-continued things to think about. What is the role of CO2? Why am I talking about CO2? Because your body does very well when it's able to effectively use CO2 in conjunction with oxygen. That's why people in high altitude live on average higher life spans, life expectancies, because 
the lower oxygen pressure up there allows for their body to more effectively retain CO2, which is why they have lower rates of disease like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, obesity, and various other chronic diseases that we think are just set in stone that we have to live with. People at higher altitude do not experience those things nearly at the rate we do, even with them eating the same garbage diet of the standard American diet. So that just shows you just introducing better retention of CO2 in your body can have tremendous effects. Again, hat off to Ray Pete, the late, great Ray Pete, for giving us these clues about CO2 and pointing our attention to the science that's been done already in those areas. Wow. Yeah, that was awesome. I know everybody listening is going to love this. This touches on a, a couple of in, uh, common themes on my show. And uh, I'll link to your stuff and your article down below. People can check it out. I'm sure they'll like it. And um, I'll, I'll link to the episode I did on your show a few months ago as well. Um, Sounds good. So they thank can, you for having me. I appreciate it. There. And thank you for your time and, and the great questions. Yeah, thank you for coming. That was that was awesome. I got a lot of lot to think about and I got my notes here. So I will. Okay. The Bible is the key to all knowledge, disarming the madness of crowds, release from bad energy that's building up in a community. Cannibalism still exists in a sublimated way, right? Religion and society and culture are synonymous. Shared story of who they are, where they came from, where they're going. And what do they value? We all need to think about the why questions. Why do we have the values we do? It was a trust system. And people think that that just pops up in a vacuum. How stupid could you possibly be? Our culture is, is built on this dead matter ideology. You are a sheep in your desires. The human grasping for God through history. We're not the people of the book. We're the people of imitating Jesus.